Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the beautiful and historic Uptown Theater and the State of the City Address by Mayor Sly James. Please take your seats so that we can enjoy a performance by our musical guest. His name is Calvin Arsenia. Please welcome him to the stage. Like a little baby orange Taunting my sweet tooth And you left me forlorn Now I'm having some problems With your philosophy Because you look like an angel And sting me like a bee Kansas City, baby What could I do? The roads here are wide and straight, but all towards is you. Now let me call. 
conjure up some courage and be jewel a few words. I'm not a rich man, but let me show you what I've earned. The sweetness and wisdom up to my knees, which is quite a bit if you think of it when you live among the trees. Kansas City, baby, what could I do? The skyline ain't the mountain high when you're living on truth. And I Traveled the world Oh, to find The most beautiful girl mm, yeah And she Was under my nose The heart Knows when it's whole Take a look at the luggage that I've been toting around. Drink at the milestones, but the best that I have found are the blessings and the proverbs. No not some words, but the faces of loved ones now. Haven't you heard of Kansas City? Baby, what could I do? I'm heartsick when I'm leaving it, but I'm coming home soon. Said I'm a heartsick when I'm leaving it, but I'm coming home soon. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause for Calvin Arsenia. something's going on in Kansas City. A big thanks to all of our dedicated city staff. I'm proud of each and every one of those and the 4,400 men and women who they represent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the clerk of Kansas City, Marilyn Sanders. Thank you. Once again, welcome to the Uptown Theater and the annual city address. State, state, state of the city address, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm proud to introduce individuals who each work diligently for our city. Welcome the city manager, Troy Schulte. Please welcome the City Council of Kansas City, Councilman Scott Wagner, First District at Large, and Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Councilwoman Heather Hall, First District. <laughs> Councilwoman Teresa Lohr, Second District at Large. <laughs> Councilman Dan Fowler, Second District. Councilman Quinton Lucas, 3rd District at Large. <clears throat> Councilman Jerrine Reed, 3rd District. <clears throat> Councilwoman Catherine Shields, 4th District at Large. <clears throat> Councilwoman Jolie Justice, 4th District. 
Councilman Lee Barnes, 5th District at Large. Councilwoman Alicia Kennedy, 5th District. Councilman Scott Taylor, 6th District at Large. Councilman Kevin McManus, 6th District. Now, all who are able, please rise for the presentation of the colors. <clears throat> Presenting our nation's colors today is Color Guards of Marine Corps Recruiting Station, Kansas City. Please rise. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Present today to deliver the invocation is the Reverend Dr. Mark Holland, Mayor and CEO of the Unified Governor of Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas. We have much to pray for today. We have, um, as we look at the challenges facing our cities, none are bigger than what we're seeing on a national scale right now. In Kansas, we have the Koch brothers, you have Sinkfeld, and nationally we have Donald Trump. At some point, we're gonna have to stand up to the narcissistic billionaires who would defund our schools, bankrupt our cities, and divide us along racial and religious lines. And I wanna to start today as I come over to say hello from the other side to invite a moment of unity and prayer as we bind together as people and citizens for the challenges that we're facing right now nationally and locally. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much for gathering us together today. Lord, we thank you for the leadership of Sly James because, Lord, we know the leadership in this great city of Kansas City, Missouri is the anchor for the entire metropolitan area, and the success of this city is the success of all of us. And, Lord, we ask for your coverage for this city as it continues to move forward, as it announces the great achievements and as it lays the groundwork for greater things yet to come. But most of all, Lord, we ask that you watch over the least, the last, and the lost. And we ask that you watch over us to prevent those from outside who would divide us, who would separate us, who would manipulate the political process for their own ideological gains, and help all of us to stay focused on the services that serve our citizens the best. We ask this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Mayor Holland and the color guards from the Marine Corps Recruiting Station of Kansas City. <clears throat> I wake up every day thinking about this city. I think about the people and the places. But more so than anything, I think about the possibilities. What lies ahead for us? What's on the horizon? You know, a lot of people are talking about Kansas City right now. But you know what I tell them? You ain't seen nothing yet.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the mayor of Kansas City, Y. James. Thank you. And thank you, Marilyn, and thank you to everyone. And good morning. Welcome to the Uptown Theater. I'd especially like to welcome those of you here today who serve in elective office. I'm thrilled that all of you are with me and with Kansas City today. And I note that Missouri State Treasurer Clint Zweifel is here all the way from Jefferson City. So if you're an elected official, would you please stand and let us recognize you for your service. Thank you all again. I want to take a moment and take you back to 2011 when I was first elected and took office. I was a little less gray, a little more rested, and I'd inherited a city that was stagnant. Back then, Kansas City was in the doldrums. Citizen satisfaction surveys were hitting lows. Local business survey results were the same. And we had a nationwide reputation for being closed for business. Downtown was only starting to crawl out of the doldrums. The recession was continuing, and the subprime mortgage crisis was rearing its ugly head, especially on Kansas City's east side. Cerner and Sporting KC had abandoned their plans to develop offices and a soccer stadium on the old Bannister Mall site. Instead, they went to Wyandotte County. Frankly, there just wasn't a whole lot of good news or things that made us very proud. And then stuff started to happen. In 2011, Google Fiber chose Kansas cities, both Kansas cities, as the first cities for its new gigabit fiber. People around the country started talking about Kansas City. Why Kansas City? What makes Kansas City so special? Why would Google go there? And all of a sudden, we had a reason to start telling people, anyone who asked, or anyone who would listen, about our city. This new notoriety and all the press and tweets that went with it gave us a new way to tell the Kansas City story. The momentum started, and our collective attitude began to change. People started to feel a sense of pride in Kansas City. People around the country became more curious about what had until then been nothing more than flyover country to them. Tech entrepreneurs discovered that Kansas City was a great place to start up. They moved here just to plug in to Google Fiber's gigabit connectivity. Many of those startups were run by millennials who had very different attitudes about the collisions between jobs, careers, lifestyle, and families than their baby boomer present, parents. A new energy started to build in the community. The Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts opened in late 2011 and immediately injected a brand new life into the west side of downtown. Major League Baseball brought the 2012 All-Star Game to Kansas City, and we showed out. People from around the world and around the country here for the first time were heard to say, I had no idea. They wrote letters to the editor, tweets, Facebook posts, praising our city and our family of citizens. We got started on the Leon Mercer Jordan Police Campus on the east side. And in late 2012, voters approved the KC streetcar linking R River Market with Union Station, and we got to work. Construction cranes started reaching for the sky shortly thereafter, many of them along the streetcar route. The streetcar also gave us a chance to replace 2.2 miles of water and sewer lines, some of it from the 1880s, which had caused flooding in the central business district for years. In the process, we created a spine for a whole new tech infrastructure called Smart and Connected City, which we will proudly open when the streetcar starts rolling down Main Street with the street party to top all street parties on May 6th and 7th. And best of all, we gave our psyche a boost. Momentum continued to build. KC started to appear on shirts, caps, mugs, socks, 
underwear, ties, beer, and virtually everything that an entrepreneur could ride it on. <laughs> Visitors from across the metro area and the region came here to enjoy our city's great cultural and entertainment offerings. The Nelson Atkins Museum of Art was rated the top museum in the nation based on Yelp reviews. The World War I Museum at Liberty Memorial is number five on that same list. The Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and the American Jazz Museum in the 18th and Vine District, Sprint Center, KC Live, and much, much war more were attractions to people from all around the region and the country. And the good feeling and the growth wasn't just downtown. The city's housing stock emerged from an eight-year federal receivership in 2013, and we finished the long-awaited Beacon Hill residential development. New student housing and streetscape improvements transformed the face of truce between Hospital Hill and Beacon Hill. Bannister Mall was cleared and Cerner returned and started work on a new campus that will ultimately be home to over 16,000 jobs. We cut the ribbon on Twin Creeks infrastructure in the Northland, which already is sprouting new development. And the Royals got better too. The All-Star Game was just a warm-up for even bigger parties. Two World Series appearances and a championship that included a parade and a rally that brought over 800,000 people into downtown without an incident. Like our World Series... <laughs> like our World Series champion Royals, we've got momentum and we're keeping the line moving. We're able to do so in part because of leaders who made tough decisions a generation or more ago. Those leaders took bold steps to address big issues in order to make Kansas City better. 50 years ago, when the city was floundering financially, city leaders decided that an earnings tax was a fair and equitable financial foundation to stabilize this great city that we enjoy today. Those leaders 50 years ago weren't just focused on day-to-day -day problems. They were building a city for the future, just as we are obliged to do for our children and grandchildren. Momentum does not build, and greatness does not occur when we are satisfied with short-term, quick-fix solutions rather than catalytic approaches that spur long-term growth. This city, any city that wants to be the best it can for its citizens, must remain focused on the future and recognize that we are all part of one Kansas City. The 4E agenda I ran on before I took office in 2011, efficiency, employment, education, and enforcement, remains our focus today because it serves as a framework that can sustain Kansas City's momentum into the future. Across the street from City Hall is a bronze statue of Eilis Davis, the mayor who in 1963 appointed the original Citizens Commission on Municipal Revenue that conceived of the earnings tax. Anita Gorman helped establish that tax back in 63 and saw firsthand what the state of our city was then. In 1963, our city was broke. We had very little bonding capacity. There wasn't anything that was working right. And so when Ilas Davis and his council was elected, we knew we needed to raise some money and we wanted to do it in a way that was fair as it could be and so we passed the earnings tax and since that time we've passed it again when Kay Barnes and her council put it into the city charter and then five years ago in 2011 we passed it with a resounding 78 percent victory if we didn't have that extra help from the outsiders, the $240 million that that earnings tax comes in would have to come from someplace else. The earnings tax wasn't a new idea. Lots of cities had it then, and over 4,000 cities and governmental bodies have it now. The earnings tax works because city res residents and people who work in the city share in the cost of operating the city. Residents tell us that in their annual survey results, 
that one of the most important city services is the overall quality of public safety. So a big chunk of the general fund logically goes to public safety, police, fire, and ambulance services. Another important point is that half of the earnings tax is paid by people who work in Kansas City but live outside of Kansas City, and they win too. Kansas City public safety officials help save lives all across the region through mutual aid agreements and the resources of the Regional Police Academy, the Fire Department Hazmat Team, and much, much more. Four area mayors, Mayor Carson Ross of Blue Springs, and three others who are here today, Mayor Randy Rhodes of Lee Summit, Mayor Eileen Weir of Independence, and Mayor Mark Holland of Kansas City, Kansas, understand this and support the earnings tax. Thank you, mayors, for your support. The voters will have their say on April 5. The entire Kansas City area loses without the earnings tax. What would it take to fully replace the earnings tax if we were to lose it? We would need a combination of massive tax increases or a massive tax in a single tax source, like doubling of sales taxes or tripling of property taxes, things that we can't even do under Missouri law to fully replace the $230 million that the earnings tax generates today. To cut our way to $230 million, we'd need to lay off more than 200 employees a year over the next 10 years, and more than half of those people would be police officers and firefighters. That would be on top of the 675 non-public safety workers we've already trimmed from city workforce since 2008. When I reconstituted the Citizens Commission on Municipal Revenue in 2011, that group found that the earnings tax is still the only viable option. Plus, we're more transparent and accountable today than we've ever been. Businesses appreciate that we run Kansas City using data, facts, and evidence to give our customers, taxpayers, residents, visitors, and companies what they expect. In a survey of 430 businesses taken late last year by the EDC, 70% rated Kansas City as an excellent or good place to do business. Tom Trabon, who passed away late last, uh, last month, started that survey several years ago and is a wonderful legacy for the city that he loved. The EDC business survey mirrors the positive momentum for the, from the city's annual citizen satisfaction survey. 80% of the citizens give us high marks as a place to live, 71% the same as a place to work, and 59% as a rate as high as a place to raise children. The marks were up significantly from both 10 years ago and five years ago when I took office. In order to keep driving efficiency, we hold departmental KC stat meetings every month, as we've done every month for the past five years. These meetings drive, dive into performance of a different city department each month. We have productive discussions with the committed professionals who run this city. Using the data, they tell us what they're doing now and what they need to do next to keep the momentum going and to continue spending taxpayer money wisely. Speaking of which, last Thursday, our city council passed a $1.53 billion budget for 2016 and 17. That budget supports neighborhoods and our young people. We'll be able to demolish dangerous buildings and invest more in summer youth employment. <laughs> Public safety departments will now comprise 75% of our $543 million general fund, 40% of which comes from the earnings tax. That leaves 25% for things like streets, sidewalks, snow removal, trash pickup, codes enforcement, and municipal court. And that means that we'll continue to have to make some tough budgetary decisions. That doesn't scare me or make me uncomfortable. If I wanted to be loved every day, I would have opened a pet store. <laughs> but I wanted to leave, so I ran for mayor. It seems to me that if we're guided by facts and data, not politics or ideology, then decisions are usually pretty clear, which brings me to the airport. 
Doing nothing is not an option for another critical part of Kansas City, the passenger terminals at KCI. Modernization is needed now if we're going to meet the present and future needs of the airlines who service and end long restroom lines inside security, improve baggage handling and de-icing equipment, meet the modern day expectations of airline passengers, and deal with the crumbling infrastructure underneath. The airlines, a city committee I appointed, our city staff have been looking at this issue in excruciating detail for over two years. We'll get a recommendation from the airlines in a few weeks so the KCI, the front door to our community, will be as inviting and as efficient as we are making the rest of our city today. Our airline partners, led by Southwest, are singing the praises of Kansas City for the collaborative way that we're doing this because the airlines and airport operations not citizen taxes will pay for whatever happens at the airport. Another way that we're improving city efficiency is through public-private partnerships that help us support an important part of the city's talent base. Women's Empowerment, or WE, is an initiative that ensures that women can bring their talents to the city and to the wider community. Through WE, and for the first time, city employees will be eligible for paid parental leave beginning this spring. And later this year, we is joining up with the Women's Foundation and the Society of Re Human Resource Management to conduct Win Work Works, a program aimed at improving the work-life balance throughout the city. So let's hear from Wendy Doyle of the Women's Foundation. My name is Wendy Doyle. I serve as president and CEO of the Women's Foundation. The Women's Foundation, we provide, um, promote equity and opportunity for women of all ages using research, developing solutions, and ultimately getting results to make meaningful change. The Women's Foundation partnered with the City of Kansas City and Mayor Sly James um, based on a research study that we commissioned looking at what holds women back to become civically engaged. And our research showed um, that the number one reason why women hold back is that they want to be asked to serve. So through, through that research and partnering with Mayor James, we developed the Appointments Project as a solution. We really wanted that to be reflective of the city's population, which is 51% of women. So that is our benchmark and what we are striving for. Women actually apply through the Women's Foundation's website. And when Mayor James has openings available, we um, submit candidates for his consideration to a board or a commission in the city of Kansas City. We are so pleased with our, with our partnership with Mayor James and with the progress and results that we are driving toward um, to date. Um, we have 20 appointments, so we are really hoping to have more women's voices at the table um, so that they can really continue to make Kansas City a great place to live and work. We empowers women in many ways and creates a culture that makes Kansas City an even better place for women and families to live and work. But efficiency isn't just about bricks and mortar. It's a people thing too, and that means jobs. Kansas City momentum is especially evident in our ability to attract new people through job opportunities and our strategic assets. The new 800 room downtown convention center hotel is a more traditional job generator and a huge asset. This hotel has been years in the making because this deal had to be right for the entire city. And it is. Our general fund is not on the hook in any way for this convention hotel. The new hotel will need about 1,500 construction workers over two years. And when it's done, hundreds of people will be needed to run the hotel. Everybody from managers and desk clerks to bartenders and wait staff. More importantly, the hotel is a key to bringing thousands of visitors to Kansas City, meaning more business for restaurants, museums, night spots, nightclubs, art galleries, and visitor attractions. Thanks to the outstanding efforts of Visit KC, millions of tourist dollars and convention dollars are heading our way even before there's been a groundbreaking. Shriners, 
associations, and major sports events that need huge blocks of rooms have agreed to come here. Many more conventions are checking us out, including several groups that previously left Kansas City because we didn't have enough hotel rooms in close proximity to the convention center. So the future is good, but that can all change in a heartbeat if the Missouri General Assembly passes Senate Joint Resolution 39. If SJR 39 becomes law, Visit KC estimates the total economic impact at risk to Kansas City could be as much as $5.6 billion, including more than $200 million from 20 sports groups alone that are currently scheduled to come here in 2017 and beyond. With all the momentum that we're enjoying now and the popularity that Kansas City has nationwide, now is not the time for state lawmakers to shut the door on billions of tourist dollars. Now recently, much has been said in recent months about incentives. Much of it has been misguided or in some instances completely false. Here are some truths. Since TIF was introduced as an economic development tool over 25 years ago, we estimate that property values in those early incentivized areas in Jackson County have more than doubled. Additionally, these investments allowed us to make needed public infrastructure improvements and create hundreds of construction and other jobs to redevelop property. 64% of new development projects since 2011 have not and did not receive any city local incentive. Let me repeat that. 64% of, of developments since 2011 received no incentive from the city. So, So let's also talk about some facts regarding development on the east side. Since 2011, we've invested over $2 billion in housing, infrastructure, and capital improvements in the area east of Truce, south of the river, and north of 63rd Street. Part of that investment includes more than $41 million in public capital improvements. Housing, economic, and public facilities, projects like Beacon Hill, St. Michael's Veterans Center, Bancroft School Affordable Housing, Oak Point Apartments, Faxon School Apartments on the Paseo, Highland Avenue Apartments in the 18th and Vine area, Phil Curl Senior Housing at 52nd and Mersington and more, added more than $156 million in East Side housing investment. The $30 million choice neighborhood grant is a major boost for the Paseo Gateway Northeast neighborhood. It will improve the lives of the residents there in many ways. Housing, education, social services, transportation, infrastructure upgrades, economic development, and reducing the digital divide. The $14 million Kansas City Major League Baseball Urban Youth Academy will use the game of baseball to help thousands of kids ages 6 to 18 develop character along with leadership, job, and athletic skills. Special thanks to all who stepped up to build the academy, especially my friend and Royals general manager, Dayton Moore, Major League Baseball, the Major League Baseball Players Association, and the Glass family. This project would still be in the idea stage without big time assists from people like Kyle Vanna, the Royals director of baseball administration, Carolyn Watley and her fundraising committee, the Kansas City Sports Commission, Populous, and VML, who created Relay the Way, our longest opening day first pitch event. This Sunday, Royals fans will pick up just where we left off last fall at Union Station. They'll throw and catch a ball all the way to the stadium, and the biggest winner will be our kids because proceeds go to the Kansas City Major League Baseball Urban Youth Academy. This city is also making a direct million-dollar-plus investment in Linwood Shopping Center, proving that we will do whatever we can to drive investments to neighborhoods that need it the most. We also propose the Shared Success Fund, another way to channel the benefits of development deals 
to the most economically distressed areas of the city, most of which are on the east side. Here's one perspective from a longtime east side resident I know well, my barber. Well, the city I see is really changing. We have a water park now. We have uh, new duplexes, a lot of new housing starts. We have a service station. Uh, buildings are getting torn down. It's really been some drastic good changes, and I see more to come. This is going to be a gold mine. Uh, it was with a ghetto, but it's coming back. This is a place to be. The people are great, and it's just a great place. Another development is starting to bloom all over Kansas City. In the past year, we cut the ribbon on Twin Creek sewer expansion, a $43 million infrastructure investment that opened up 13,000 acres of land for future development in Kansas City's Northland. In South Kansas City, warehousing and transportation businesses continue to find a home near Kansas City Southern's intermodal facility, a place that solidifies Kansas City as a transportation hub and the logistical crossroads of the nation. And so has our growing reputation for technological innovation and entrepreneurship. With Google Fiber and Smart and Connected City, Kansas City has at its finger fingertip the economic infrastructure of the 21st century. That type of infrastructure makes Kansas City attractive to all kinds of people with all kinds of ideas. A person with an idea, that's the economy of the future, not big box development routed, rooted in billions of dollars of incentives. And because of that, we strongly support programs like Launch KC. Last year, the first 10 Launch KC grant recipients received a half million dollars, $50,000 each, by winning a business competition that drew applicants from around the world. And we're not stopping. Applications for Launch KC 2016 will be accepted beginning this Friday. We look forward to Tech Week in September when 10 more grants will be awarded. Kansas City's tech momentum ramped up this month when we turned on our kiosks and Wi-Fi downtown. Already, our smart and connected city ecosystem in partnership with Cisco and Sprint and others is helping make us a finalist city in a $50 million grant competition sponsored by the Department of Transportation Smart City Grant. Our tech companies need more trained help. People who can manage the flow of information and data, write codes, fix equipment, and implement creative ideas. And lots of people in our city need jobs, or better paying jobs, to support their families. The White House Tech Hire Program helps people develop their tech job skills and then helps them land apprenticeships that blossom into permanent employment. Many, many thanks to Clyde McQueen and the Full Employment Council and several other groups for collaborating on Tech Hire. Beyond training, residents need to be connected to take full advantage of the tech jobs coming our way. That's one benefit of being part of HUD's initiatives like Connect Home and Connect Ed that bring high-speed broadband to families and students in public housing. Many partners, public and private, are working together to make sure that we sustain the momentum that Google Fiber kick-started just five years ago and enables residents to get fully trained and fully employed. Of course, in order to have a well-trained adult in our future workforce holding down a good paying job, we have to make sure that Kansas City's kids have a quality, world-class education. So basically, we go into underprivileged areas um, and we try to, our goal is to decrease the literacy gap between the low income and the affluent. We see a lot of momentum starting to build up here in Kansas City. Um, when I came, I remember not really thinking about or talking about very much the intersection between innovation, entrepreneurialism, and education, and now I think that that's definitely a conversation that is happening. Well, we know that there's not one right school for every family, and um, so we really encourage you know, parents to consider all the district schools, the private schools, the charter schools, the parochial schools, um, whatever school is right for their family. We first came into contact with Turn the Page uh, about a year ago, actually, 
during Read Across America Day, put a bunch of young professionals in their 20s and 30s into a school to read books to some kids, and really fell in love with the simplicity uh, of how you know we can actually make a difference. And I sit in a class every Wednesday with my my little friend Mung, and we read books. And I'd say even just in the course of you know less than a year, I've watched him change the level of books that he's reading and he's not stumbling on words that he used to stumble on um, and more than anything like I leave and he sometimes gives me a piece of art or just a big hug or a high five. For over a generation there's been a narrative in Kansas City that once your children turn five you have to move out of the city uh, but that's starting to change. Parents and community members they love their neighborhoods, they love their communities and they want to stay and they want to be a part of the solution. It's very important that we have organizations that help these children to basic, to know these things, to learn these things, so they can move forward and maybe even get them to learning how to read before they enter kindergarten. And it really helps. It helps a lot. You know, like our vision is to see Kansas City as a world-renowned hub for innovation and education. And so um, I think that really bringing together and, and building a community is something that's really important. And we have already seen a lot of success in that. At the end of the day, we can build all we want to, but in another 20 years, um, what will that education system look like for the people who are moving right now who are going to have kids someday? I love reading to kids. It's one of the highlights of my days as mayor. I've read to kids in over 100 schools since 2011, and each time I've seen firsthand the great energy and momentum that's happening in Kansas City schools. I'm hearing less complacent or excuse-ridden language about why some of our schools are not performing well, and I'm hearing more adults say that we need to do more to ensure that all kids succeed, regardless of where they live, and regardless of the color of their skin. We have schools that are not lowering the expectation bar for kids, but instead providing additional support in order to help kids achieve at high levels. Supports like City Year and Literacy Lab. Through City Year, 17 AmeriCorps members work closely with students in Central Middle School and the Kaufman School, keeping them on track to graduate by improving their attendance, behavior, and course performance. And Literacy Lab has 22 trained literacy tutors in six elementary schools and three Head Start centers focused solely on growing a child's literacy competence and ability. Both City Year and Literacy Lab will more than double the number of kids they support next school year. That's momentum in the right direction. Turn the Page KC, an organization I formed in my first days in office, has created tremendous momentum around third grade reading proficiency. Turn the Page KC was recognized earlier this month by the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading as a pace setter program, sweeping all the award categories. Out of 180 communities, only six communities accomplished this achievement, and Kansas City was one of the six. That's because of the hardworking individuals at Turn to Page KC, from our board of directors, our excellent staff, to the classroom volunteers who roll up their sleeves and get to work every single day for our young people. Turn to Page convened the summit to address attendance issues faced by highly mobile students. We hosted over 1,000 kids at a summer reading festival at the Sprint Center and gave, gave away over 300,000 books with help from Link and First Book. And, and we created a school readiness social media campaign called Dad's Turn to Page and put books in barber shops to support fathers in being their child's first and best teacher. So we have some positive momentum in education, but there is still, still so much more to do. We need to do more to make sure that every child in Kansas City lives near a quality school. Right now, the distribution of quality schools across the city is inequitable. The green dots on the map show where they are. 
Four out of five schools that are located in affluent areas are considered high quality, yet only one in five schools located in more distressed areas are considered high quality. This is neither right nor acceptable. We as a community must apply pressure and get momentum going to increase access to quality schools for every single child, regardless of their zip code. I'm willing to listen to any cogent idea on how we can make access to quality schools easier and fairer. And I will support anyone who improves or adds more quality schools in our target areas. Quality schools revitalize neighborhoods, which is why every citizen should support our public schools. Be sure to vote next Tuesday, April 5th, if you live in a district holding a board election. For kids to get the education they deserve, school districts should be governed by a board of highly effective, visionary leaders. <laughs> Quality schools will be within our grasp when we have awesome teachers in every single classroom, in every single building. Teachers shape the future generations of this city with such a tremendous responsibility, they should be highly trained, and deeply supported, which is why I like Kansas City Teacher Residency. It trains teachers just like we train doctors through a residency model. It's a model that we know works. Nationwide, residency graduates outperform their peers in student achievement and overall teacher performance. And more than 80% of residency graduates are still teaching in classrooms after three years, compared to only roughly half of traditionally trained teachers. Kansas City Teacher Residency aims for half of its residents to be people of color. That's a much needed goal since only about 5% of the teachers in Missouri are people of color. Every child deserves a quality school in their neighborhood and a quality teacher in their classroom. They also deserve quality opportunities when they're not in school. Youth in this city should be safe from violence, connected to caring adults, inspired to pursue their passions, and ready for the workforce. However, access to these types of opportunities are just as inequitably distributed as quality schools. So we created Mayor's Nights and Club KC Summer Programming and the Higher KC Youth Initiative. Employing young people in meaningful summer jobs sets them on a path to be lifelong earners and contributors to our city. Higher KC Youth is hosting a job fair on, on April 16th. That's April 16th. I ask businesses large and small to please join Kansas City in hiring KC youth this summer. You can contact Chantel Garrett in my office to discuss how you can help. Earlier this month, Kansas City got more good news that we are now a pilot community for LRNG. Now that stands for learning in case you're starting to fade out on me a little bit. LRNG connects youth to in school, out of school, employer-based and online learning experiences that align with their interests and passions. For example, our young people may test their ideas at a maker meetup, learn to code at a local library, hone their creative writing skills at a poetry slam at a nearby coffee shop. You know, we've made positive momentum when it comes to increasing educational opportunities for our young people, but nothing can change a child's life like a quality education. Nothing we've done to improve efficiency, boost employment, or educate our kids means anything if our citizens aren't safe. We can't expect entrepreneurs to embrace our city of innovation if they feel unsafe or, grow their idea, or to grow their ideas here. We can't expect businesses to stay here or move here if their employees and products are at risk. We can't expect families to raise their children here if our schools, parks, and neighborhoods aren't safe. Police and firefighters put their lives on the line every day to ensure our safety. Two of those firefighters, Larry Leggio and John Mesh, lost their lives in the line of duty last October, fighting a fire in the neighborhood that they grew up in. They love their families and they love their city. So please join me now in a moment of silence, honoring the memory and the service of our fallen firefighters 
Larry Leggio, and John Nash. Thank you. If we can't protect our kids from being gunned down in the street, or even in their very own homes, all the momentum we're feeling as a city comes to a screeching halt. We owe it to our children to do more. We owe it to 17-year-old Shannon Rollins Jr., 17-year-old Bianca Fletcher, and her one-year-old son, Joseph, all of whom were murdered in their home last September. We owe it to a three-year-old, Amorian Hale, who was sleeping in his bed when his life was cut short by a bullet fired through his home. And we owe it to the six other kids who were under the age of 16 when their lives were claimed by violence this past year. It is our collective duty to correct, to protect our children. Now, KC Nova is sustaining the momentum of using better and more coordinated intelligence to focus our resources on that very small number of individuals who cause most of the violent crime in this city. And I want to give a special shout out to the NOVA governing board members and their commitment to ending violence in this city. NOVA partners work together closely to keep our citizens safe, and I cannot thank this group enough for the work that they do. I want to especially thank Chief Darrell Forte and my good friend, Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker, both of whom understood that changing the way their departments were organized could yield better results. Thank you both good people doing good things. This approach works, and we're proud of what we're doing. And I'm continually inspired by the work of our partners, especially Rosalind Temple of Mothers in Charge. Mothers in Charge, we're mothers that, that, that take our streets back, our community back. We take a stand here every day and so to support our community, um, our families, our police departments, our mayor, um, our community, period. We're tired of burying our children. Every day I wake up every morning, I know it's something that I need to do. So here I stand every day here in Kansas City to say enough is enough of losing our children. We're trying something new. Everybody's willing to step out that side of their comfort zone, their comfort box, and try to partnership, to hear another person, to hear a mother like me. You know, how many cries of a mother that they, we have heard here in Kansas City before it happened to me in 2011? I've seen many families, many, but when I just took a stand, I just couldn't breathe anymore. And I came and said, uh-uh, something gotta be different. My biggest dream is to reduce our violence acts, homicide, and come together as a city like no other. If my community just can come and more be more boldly and speak out and get these perpetrators off of our streets and so our children can roam the parks and go to schools and shop in the malls and the shopping centers, be free, not worried about if a bull is gonna strike me. KC Nova is working. And with a community that we have, starting off with our mayor and our chief of police, our prosecutor, I say our federal partners, um, our probation and parole, and the community itself, we're coming together like never before and saying the same language, speaking the same song, and standing together and trying to make a difference in our community. Even as homicides rose last year compared to 2014, group-related homicides held relatively steady and remained significantly lower than in 2013. We know other issues, domestic violence and child abuse, were at the heart of the 2015 uptick in homicides. We will continually update our implementation of NOVA by focusing on high-risk teens with programs like Teens in Transition or TNT. TNT is NOVA's 10-week summer program at, Ar at Arts Tech where we work with at-risk youth, many of whom were referred by school resource officers or teachers. Some previously had negative contacts with police department and law enforcement. Others missed multiple days of school or they might have been suspended on a fairly regular basis. 
Some were associated with violent individuals or negative influences. While in TNT, young people are expected to show up, work hard on a community art project, and take responsibility for their lives. The growth of these teens in that 10 weeks is truly amazing. Many of these teens are now on their way to high school graduation or are looking at college or technical trade training. Yearly results prove that TNT works. Kids respond when given opportunities to succeed by people who believe and care for them. While NOVA has made overall gains on group violence, it is still increasingly difficult to reduce the violence when the number of illegal guns flooding our urban streets continues at this rate. But I and many other mayors across the country are frustrated because state and federal laws tie the hands of cities when it comes to any sort of meaningful opportunity to control that flood. Last October, Politico magazine found 89% of the mayors believe Congress is doing too little to address gun violence. I'll continue to call for common sense legislation at the state level that can coexist with the Second Amendment, starting with an armed offender docket pilot program in our courts. And I want to recognize Representative Kevin Corlew for introducing this important legislation and for consistently supporting this effort. He exercised leadership on this subject by supporting legislation based on common sense, facts and data, not political rhetoric and ideology. I look forward to joining him again in Jefferson City next week for the hearing on this important bill. With a system in place that makes sure that justice is swift, criminals might think twice before doing something tragic, cruel, and stupid, like take the life of a sleeping toddler. Kansas City must reduce the violence so that everyone here and everyone who wants to be here will be safe at home, at work, and in the community. Efficiency, employment, education, and enforcement formed the framework for my run for mayor five years ago and again last year. It's the platform we use to bring people together, to change our city's trajectory, and to start and sustain the momentum of civic pride and progress that we enjoy today. That momentum only continues, though, with careful planning and impeccable execution focused on the city of the future. So it is more than important, it is absolutely critical that we continue to build on that momentum. That means making decisions that benefit the entire community based on facts and data and implementing those decisions in a fair and balanced way. It also means retaining the earnings tax, which plays a vital role in keeping the momentum going. Now is not the time to disrupt the success and the momentum of our city with misguided attempts to change a basic funding mechanism. Businesses, large and small, and citizens from all corners of the city like the result. That's true because Kansas City is reawakening unlike any time in recent memory. And I pledge to continue to work as hard as I possibly can for the city that I love. And I remain undeterred in my resolve to make this city best, not just for today, but for our kids and our grandkids. And as I look ahead, I will work as hard as necessary to leave this city not only better than I found it, but the envy of cities nationwide and worldwide. My friends, the state of our city is full of momentum and pride, and I refuse to let it slow down. I thank you for supporting our efforts, and I thank you for being here with me today.
Don't go, don't go too far away, folks. A uh, surprise is about to happen. knows every place I go. He's bound away from home. She don't care if I'm asleep or I'm awake. This fickle heart just turns to stone. Going back to Kansas City.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Naughty Pines with special guest, Mayor Sly James. Thank you for attending the State of the City Address.